you answer question two. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, cool. So yeah, the stock, uh, we're going to look at um, what sort of callback based asynchronous programming looks like. Uh, some of you that have been doing JavaScript for a while have probably seen that. Uh, it's really popular in like jQuery. Uh, still really popular today, still really works really well today for some things. Um, but uh, promises can be a little bit easier to work with, a little easier to reason about, especially once you get into async await sort of stuff. So we're going to look at kind of what the different syntax looks like. And at the end, we're going to kind of refactor some very rudimentary application uh, that you might be dealing with some old code base that is callback based and re how to refactor that into promise based. Cool. Any questions before I get started? Saying that you, you consider promises easier to read and maintain than callbacks? Yeah, I think at the point that you have async await available, so browser support it, but you might, depends on what your project needs to support. If you're using Node, uh, I think Node version 8 supports async await and anything before that. So if you have like a, an application running in Node that uses something less than eight, you may have uh, like a promise-based tool, but not necessarily promise. Like you might need like a polyfill or something. Cool. So yeah, we are gonna have a, a very basic application here that, uh, can you all see that okay? Oh, maybe too big. Cool, good. I don't think I need so much space over here. And our, our very basic application uh, is just going to import a function called run and then call it. So as we go through, we're going to have the different versions of what that looks like. Uh, starting out, we're going to start with a callback based version. And let's see if I might need to refresh the page. Okay. If I run that application, it's going to install some packages because I need to wait. So it's going to start with a number. It's going to add one to that number. It's going to double the results of that, and it's going to square the results of that. And what that looks like if callbacks is we're going to have, we're going to define a function called async add, which is going to take a number, and it's going to take a callback. Uh, we're going to use set timeout so that we can take advantage, or so that we can sort of mock asynchronous uh, functionality. And then in that timeout, that timeout is going to take 500 milliseconds. And after which it's going to call the function that we provide to it that takes the number that we originally had. And it sets that number's value to the original number plus one, right? It adds one. Uh, once that has completed, it's going to call whatever function we pass in as our callback with our new value. Any questions so far? Cool. Uh, sorry, what? Anyone? No? Okay. So after that, we're going to define another function called async double. It's going to look very similar. It's going to take a, a, a number and a callback, and it's going to set n to n times 2. Uh, async square is going to take a number and a callback, and it's going to set n to n times n, and it's going to call the callback with the new value, right? So that's our function definition. It's pretty basic. It's asynchronous. Uh, and the only thing you have to keep in mind is that it takes in a number, and it takes in a callback, and it calls the callback on the result. Uh, question. That CD for callback, is that a variable? Is it a function? What exactly is callback? Good question. So when we define a function, uh, if we start from just the basics, we can say function, uh, my function name can be anything that I want. And it's going to take uh, some parameters, right? Parameter one, parameter two. Uh, and then we can say, in this case, maybe we're going to return P1 plus P2. So in this case, we're saying add, right? It's going to take one number, it's going to take another number, and then we can call it by saying add one and two, and we would expect this to be three. Right, but right? where it says cbn, it looks like cb is a function and n is its parameter, but I don't see cb defined as a function. <laughs> right, so 
That's a good question. And essentially what we're doing here is P2 is what we're passing in here, right? We're defining the function add the same or add async add the same way we're defining regular add, right? So P2 in this case uh, is just an arbitrary parameter name, but we're saying because of how we're defining our function, we're saying that we expect it to be a function. So in this case, P2 is the same as CB, right? Where instead of return one plus one or whatever, we'll maybe do something with one, but then because P2, we, ex we expect it to be a, uh, a function as the parameter, it would be like call the function. So the reason I say CB is, stands for callback, it's an arbitrary naming convention. It can literally, it can be uh, literally anything, right? Uh, and that's just what I've decided to name that parameter for the sake of being short. Just CB is fine. But when I use this, because I'm this is my this is my application. When I use this, I know that every time I use this, I should pass in a number, and I should pass in a callback. Now there are certain things that you can do uh, to in your applications to make sure that it's a function that you're getting in. You can make sure that it's defined. So you can say uh, only call this like if CB is defined, then we call it, right? But for the sake of, I, I, I don't want to focus too much on the best practices of writing a function, but rather focus on uh, transferring callback-based API to a promise-based API. So we won't do any type checking, we won't do any uh, error handling, but we're, we're, we're working with just the happy path here. Right, everything should work because it's simple and we're writing it. Okay, so CB stands for callback. Uh, it's going to, it's go always going to be a method. It doesn't have to call n. It could call hello, right? And then whatever I pass in as that as that callback function is going to receive hello as the parameter that it gets. Uh, but in this case, we're going to call it with the new variable of n. If n is one, it's going to set n as equal to n equals one plus one, which is going to make it two, which means this callback is going to receive two when it runs, and then we define it, right? So we get down, we get past our function declarations, and then we get into actually defining the application. So we're going to say the function run is going to take a parameter. In my case, this is extra. We don't need that. I'm going to say that regardless what I pass in, it's going to always, it's always going to accept the number one as a variable, right? This could also even be, uh, I think, right? So run is just a function that's going to run and do some things. When it, when this function gets invoked, we're going to define a variable called my number and set it equal to one. And then we're going to console log that number, right? So that's where we are here which makes sense. And then we're going to call async add, which again expects a number and a callback function. So when we call async add within the body of run, we're going to pass in my number, which is one, and then we're going to define our callback function, right? Our callback function, this is just the same as doing uh, this. No, it's not function result, right? Maybe yeah, how many people have seen this pattern before? You have, you call thing, you pass in a parameter and then you pass in a callback function that will then run after that has completed, right? Is that called an anonymous function? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this would be an anonymous function because we haven't named it. Um, so if this looks weird, this is uh, modern ES6 syntax, but it's essentially the same as what we had uh, yeah, I believe no lambda functions. I believe are considered for like cloud functions, okay. so they're running in the cloud instead of like. No, no, he, he is right. It is a lambda function. Is it? That's generally like other languages. Yeah. In JavaScript, you just call it like fat arrow. Yeah. Anonymous function. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, if that if that arrow function looked weird, just in in this case, it's exactly the same as saying function with the parameter that we're passing in, right? Uh, oops, so that's what that looks like. Result here, 
where does this come from? Well, this comes from uh, what the function is going to provide to us, right? It's going to be this guy. So once we get that result, we have async add, we're gonna pass this in. It's going to run our, uh, it's gonna run the logic inside and then it's going to call the callback with something, right? In this case, we're just naming this. Again, this could be literally anything. Whatever, you see that? Result, okay. And then we're going to just update. Oh, this actually has to be a let. We're going to update the value of my number to the result. This doesn't have to be that. We could say const new number, right, or whatever. I'm just recycling the same variable that I've already defined. And I'm saying, I'm setting my number now to the result. So at this point, we would expect that because my number was one and add async adds one and then calls the callback on the, on the new number, uh, we would expect my number to be two, one plus one, right? So we say console log plus one equals my number. So that's where we are here, plus one equals two. And then now we have our new number, which is my number is two. And we're going to say, once we get that, let's also double that. So we, let's see. If I just left it here and then I said, you know, I don't know, uh, const r equals this, right? And then I tried to console log, actually, let me say, I say, I assign my number to the result of async add, my new number, right? And we can just get rid of that and we probably don't even need that. Um, and we console log my number, what should we expect that to be? Anyone? It would be one, correct. And why is that? It's because, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, you look like you. Um, it, it's because the uh, it's not going to wait for that async function to finish. It's just going to continue to go down. Correct. So, so because this is asynchronous uh, functions, right? Because we're using set timeout, this is asynchronous. <laughs> means that it's like an AJAX request. We actually don't want this. We don't want our our code base to hold up while this function calculates. That could take a long time. In our case, it's taking five hundred milliseconds. It could take. 5,000, right? Uh, so we don't want to keep waiting for that. So what would happen here is uh, because we're using set timeout, this is asynchronous. This is still going to run uh, the functionality that we provided. This is, still going to, this is still going to change my number to two. However, in here, let's see, inside, right? What we have here is because this is asynchronous, the code base is going to move past that, get down to the console log, and then this is going to complete. And after once this completes, then the body of the function gets run. All right. So if I run that, we get undefined. What's that? Yeah, actually, you don't return anything. I don't return anything. Yeah. True. So that's why. But any, anyway, that was all just as an example to show you uh, to get the, the mind in the right place, right? Is that these are asynchronous calls, so we can't just assign it to the result of the function. A couple questions. On the console.log, I usually use a plus. So mm -hmm. um, instead of the that console.log, I'm going to use the console.log plus the new number. Mm -hmm. And so that way, instead of that comma, so is the comma and plus interchangeable, meaning just concatenate those two? Uh, comma and plus are not interchangeable because the plus is going to concatenate it to the string. Right. In our case, uh, it's it's just going to log those two different things. So the result kind of looks the same, uh, but uh, so in, in our case, they could be the same, but technically speaking, uh, having a plus there is not the same because if it was, if, if, if we, well, JavaScript is funny because if it is a number and it is a string and you and you add a number to a string, it will cast that as a string. Yeah. So it'll convert the number to the string and then concatenate it, right? So it will work, but it's technically not the same thing. If these two things 
if, for example, I had it the other way around and it was a number first plus a string, I think it would say it would throw not a number error. So it'd be safer to use the comma all the time. Is that a bottom I don't necessarily think so. This is how I choose to do it. Uh, if you are working with strings, you can use a plus sign. A lot of people do. I don't think it's one is better or worse. But if you use a comma, you can log as many as many variables or expressions as you like, and it doesn't make a difference. A more substantive question, though, back to your callback. Is there an implied return within your... Um, of the function up above? Uh, in this case, no, there's not. Well, like, the result was coming back, and you said as a result of running line four, and in my mind, from other languages, I would think return space CD, so then. Right, so because it's asynchronous, though, we're not necessarily going to be, it's not going to be so valuable to us to return from inside of the body of that function, because I think, for one, we are, if we return from in here, we're not returning the value of this function. We're returning this function, or returning we're 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 calling the return for this function. So I guess I was so, trying to figure out how is it, how is it working to get into the result without the return. That, that's what I was trying to get my head around. How how are we getting to the result without the return? Yeah. Well, we aren't. We aren't. We aren't calling. It's not like a normal function that says. Uh, call function and like my results equals the response of the function, right? right? It's not the same because this is synchronous and this is asynchronous. And so if I wanted to return a value inside of the body of this function, I would have to do that outside of the set timeout. I'd have to do that here, right? But this is not useful to me in callback based API because this is going to return immediately and it's not going to wait for the set timeout to finish. So in this case, we're using a set timeout, but it, again, it could be an Ajax request. So if this, for example, was an Ajax request, then the Ajax request would be sent and then we would return whatever, maybe I don't know, anything. Yeah, we could, we could return that it was like a string that says sent, but we wouldn't actually have access to what the response is because it would return before uh, it gets back, right? So though that's where the paradigm of having a callback back based function, having callback based API makes sense is that when we have it available, well, okay, let's pass in, a, it could be an anonymous function, right? Just give me the option to do something with that data when it gets back. Yeah, sweet. So what we're doing here is, that's just exactly what we're doing is we're calling our thing uh, it could be an Ajax request, and then as the callback function, this is what this is what I'm providing to the API consumer as a way to interact with the data once it returns. Well, that's like the sign right there on line 27. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, arrow. yeah. This fat, this this this. Let's see, where are we? This fat arrow, right? If I what was that? Uh, the body of this function right here, everything that happens in here is what's being called right here. It's this. Cool. Sweet. Good questions. I like it. So then what we do is uh, we kind of just like chain callback after callback, right? We say uh, go out and asynchronously add one. Cool. And once, we, once we're done with that, give me the results. And I'm going to do something with the results here and then take those results and pop them into the async double. So now we're gonna say asynchronously go and double that value, right? Because this is the new value. So we're gonna get that. And once that finishes running, we're gonna have this callback where again, we're providing result. This doesn't, this is not the same result as here, right? This is arbitrary, whatever. That can be that, that can be that. As long as I'm using, as long as within the body of the function, I'm, you know, using the same name. Uh, and then once we have doubled our thing, uh, we're going to asynchronously square. Again, we're going to have our new value. We're gonna drop it into the async square as a first parameter. And as our second parameter, we have a callback, which provides us the results of, oh, the results of squaring it. 
And inside of that callback function, we're going to use our results. And in our case, all we're gonna do is console log, right? So if we run this, we get an internal server error because res is not defined. Is this up here? Yeah, there we go, cool. Two, clean up. And we run that. And you see how there's 500 milliseconds between each one, right? That's because of that timeout. So that's what a callback-based API sort of looks like. And uh, as a result of using it, it can be a little bit confusing, especially if you switch, if you, if you get those functions from different, a lot of different files and then use them in a lot of different files, right? Because then it, it's really confusing to keep track of the logic of where those callbacks are going and what's going on. You also get into this like callback hill thing, which is like a Christmas tree. So what's the solution? Well, a good approach is, let me get rid of that, go to the promises, just so we know that that's working, is promises. So what we can do with a callback-based API is we can work with promises. Now, promises you may have worked with from the fetch API, or you work with a new library that returns promises. And so what they look like is, uh, you know, we call uh, some function, we pass in our variable, and then uh, with promises, they give us this, right? Then the results, and we do something with the results, right? Does this look, this look familiar to people? Does this look strange to anyone? So what callbacks give us is the dot access to the dot then method, right? And so what we can do is in we can convert asynchronous functions to callbacks quite easily, actually, is if we had the function async add before and it took a number and it took a callback, and then this is the body of the function, right? It's going to call set timeout. It's going to do n, n equals n plus one, and it's going to call the callback on the new n. Is we can define a promise-based solution. We'll call it promise add. And now, because we're not using the callbacks, we actually only need to take the one parameter that we were using before. And then right away, here we are going to return within the body of this function, right? So we're going, what are we going to return is a new promise. Now the promise, the syntax for promises is uh, they take a function. Uh, in our case, this, you know, for anyone uh, not familiar with the function, the, short, the fat arrow thing, that's kind of what that looks like is it takes a function that has two parameters. You don't have to use both parameters, but you have a resolve, you have a reject. Uh, when you have a successful operation, you call the resolve function. Uh, if you have an error, so for example, a user gives a bad password and you want to use a promise, whatever, you can reject. And reject is going to throw an error. Uh, where are we? Cool. So what we do is we, uh, to convert, convert our async add with the callback, based API is we say promise add is going to right away return a new promise. Uh, it's going to accept a resolve and reject, or it's going to accept a function that has resolve and reject as other sort of callbacks you could think of. Uh, and then we're going to pass in essentially the same body of the function as we have above, except instead of the callback, we're going to resolve. So we're going to set the timeout. We're going to say n equals n plus one, which n we're getting from the function when we call it. Or, and uh, once we have the solution, we're going to resolve with the new value. That's going to resolve. This this resolve is going to be called after the 500 seconds of the 500 milliseconds of the set timeout. Does that make sense to everyone? Does anyone have questions about that? No. Cool. So that's what that looks like. Right, and we can say do 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 do. So that's what that ad looks like. Uh, whoa, that's not right. All right. 
Okay. Uh, we do the same thing with uh, double. We take one parameter and we return a new promise that has resolve and reject. In our case, we don't even really need to use reject because we're not, this is never going to fail, so we never have to reject. Um, but that's kind of the syntax that you'll see. Again, resolve and reject, arbitrary names. Can be whatever. Meh, right? We just have to make sure that the first parameter that we pass into this function is going to be what does this promise do when it resolves is we resolve with meh. Reject, no, right? Um, actually, you know what? This is going to be whoop. There we go. All right. Whoop and now. Uh, yep. Just out of curiosity, well, I know you said that that will never get rejected, but what happens if it does get rejected? So the, yeah, that's a good question. Is It's not going to get rejected on its own. When you define a new promise, uh, if, you, if you're using a library that uses promises and you pass in something that doesn't work properly, it's going to give you, uh, it's going to reject for you, right? So the way that, nope, 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 nope. The way that looks is you're going to say my li nope, some library, right, which is going to return a promise. Uh, it's going to take in cool beans, and it's going to do something with that. And when that resolves, we're going to it's going to we're going to have the then method that we can do something, right? Uh, with then we can say we're going to take the response and we're just going to console dot log that. All right. This is very short syntax. If anyone has questions, please raise your hands. Let me know. Uh, so what happens when that gets rejected is what if this didn't like the space in here for whatever reason, or this was, or some lib had to use uh, an integer instead of a string. Well, this is going to have an error. So this, the the promise that we get from this is going to reject. And so what we can do is we can catch that error and we can do something with it, right? Yeah, you can log it, you can send it to some, you know, error tracking API or whatever, you can do absolutely nothing. Uh, this catch will help us from our applications blowing up in the case that uh, we do something wrong and the promise does reject. Uh, but essentially reject, when you define your own promise, uh, if it's something that could error, so for example, um, so if, if yeah, if if we say like type of n does not equal number, right? Then we could say, you know what, before this before everything else even goes, let's reject. Nice try. Oops. And we probably want to do like a new error. There we go. Right? So something we actually probably want to return from inside there as well, because otherwise this is the promise won't continue, but this will actually still get called. Uh, but so if we have something that we need to prevent, again, like a user login is a good example, is if a user tries to do something and they aren't authenticated, uh, you might want to reject their that promise attempt. Uh, I don't want to get too far down that rabbit hole because we're not talking about error handling. But that's what the that's what reject would be used for. Again, arbitrary name can be whatever. But the second parameter that we pass into this uh, function is going to be the reject method or function call. Okay, cool. So we've got our promise add uh, promise double very much the same. Returns a new promise. We've got resolve and reject. It's going to say n equals n times or n equals n times two, and then it's going to resolve with the new value of n. So if n here, if this is two, n is going to then be set to four, and we're going to resolve with the new value of n, which is four, okay? Uh, promise square, same thing, takes a number, uh, returns a new promise. In that promise, we define resolve and reject. It's gonna set a timeout, and it's gonna say, take whatever the number, take whatever the parameter that we got in, and multiply it by itself and then resolve. So when that promise completes, we're going to have n squared. 
The way that looks when we run it is, again, let me set my number equal one, right? Say set my number equal two. So this is what that syntax kind of looks like, is now that we have these functions defined and we know where that we're getting back promises, we can say, okay, inside of my application, I wanna call promise add with my number, and then I'm going to have the results. And with those results, I'm going to set my number equal to the new result. I'm going to console log that new result. And then I'm going to uh, double that. So once again, it kind of looks similar to the callbacks is here we have our function declaration, our parameter, and then as the second parameter, we have the new, the callback function. With the promises, we're only passing in our one parameter because our function only accepts one parameter. Uh, and then we're using the then method, which accepts a, a function. Does that make sense? It's still so, nested. Yeah. It is still nested. The reason being, the reason it's still nested is because we still need to use the result in our new in our new method call, right? If we didn't, we could put these promises one after another, but then I don't have the result from the first promise to use in the second promise. I don't have the result from the second promise to use in the third promise. Yeah, so like, couldn't you return promise double and then put the then below instead of nesting it? You could, you could, and that would, probably look a little bit nicer as well. Um, but we're gonna get on to async await. So before we do that. Um, so this is a way you could do it and you could return the promises and you could have like the thens chaining, uh, but much nicer in my opinion is async await. So once again, actually the function calls are going to be exactly the same as before. Let me fix this to prove that we're still working. Is what async await does is it gives us two keywords, async and await, which lets us define the function as being an asynchronous function inside of which it, we are expecting to call await. If we try to use await without saying, without using the async uh, keyword, it's going to blow up because it's going to say, hey, this doesn't make sense, right? Let's, why not see that? Oh, do, 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 await my number, whatever. It's going to cause the application to blow up, right? If you're using async and you don't use await, you're actually going to be just fine. Because what async does is it actually converts uh, this function into a promise. So when you're using the async keyword, I didn't know this for a long time, but when you're using an async keyword and you call, uh, you know, let's see, const r equals run, the result of that, r is actually going to be a promise at that point. So we could then call uh, r dot then and blah 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 right so that's just one one thing to keep in mind but the nice thing is is that it makes our our uh our logic a lot simpler it makes it look a lot more like synchronous code right we can say console log start my number or log my number right and then uh we're going to say my number is actually going to be we're going to reassign it to the whatever this promise resolves to this promise, we're passing in my number, which it, we're getting from here, right? So we're taking this number, we're passing it in here. Once this promise resolves, we're going to reassign my number to the result of that promise. And then we're going to console log the new, the new value. And then we're going to pass that into uh, promise double. And then uh, we're going to assign the result of that to my number again and you get it, right? So if we say, let's see, we used one and two, let's, uh, let's set that to three, so we can see if that works. Starts through with three, plus one equals four, doubled equals eight, squared equals 64, right? And this is a really nice syntax to work with. Now, 
you might have errors. So some of you that are familiar with async await, you might know that, well, if any of these promises do error and we're awaiting it, that's gonna blow up our application. So a lot of times you'll see uh, people use a try catch block, right? So you get that and then you get catch error and then we do something with the error. Right, so this is a this is a pretty common pattern that you'll see with async await. This basically will say uh, within any of these uh, promises that run, if any of them reject, if any of them error out, that block is going to catch that error. So the async await is going to throw an error if any of these uh, reject. And then it's not so if this first one rejects, it's not even going to get to the next two. This is going to throw, and then inside of that try catch is we're going to throw that error down to the catch, we're going to catch the error, and then we're going to do something with the error, right? Now, you that's one approach. You could also, uh, in our case, we know that these are not going to reject because one plus one is never going to reject, right? Uh, but if, for example, this had a very special error message that we wanted to uh that we wanted to throw instead of just like, hey, your whatever application is blowing up, you can always uh, drop a catch right there on the end. And we can say we catch the error. And then in this case, we're going to just console log that error. But what the user is actually going to see is uh, throw new error, error, error. Uh, you suck at math, right? Uh, so this is a way that we could essentially like transform, or sorry, we actually, we probably wouldn't throw it here because in that try catch, if we still had that try catch, we can throw here and it would be fine. Um, but in this case, because we're catching our error, we're not using a try catch block, we wanna probably, I don't know, handle it some other way, All right? Does that make sense to everyone? How would you rewrite that error or without that error? Uh, catch would take a function that has one parameter. Uh, we're calling our parameter error. Again, can be anything. And as long as we are using it with the same parameter name, we are fine. And take the fat error out. And take the fat error out. And if you're going, well, yeah, you're not going to return anything in there. But yeah. Cool. So that's that. We're going to get rid of that. So then the next thing is you're going to say, man, those promises are pretty sweet. And I've been working with these callbacks that are not so sweet. Um, that happened to me recently. I was working on a, a new API. I'm adopting an API that was written by someone before. And I wanted to work with promises because I really like the syntax and I think they're very easy to reason with. And so I had to refactor our API. Our API was callback based. So you might say, well, let's look at this, right? We have, all we're really dropping in here is this, right? For prom between promise add and, and async add, all we're doing is returning a new promise, uh, we're closing that off there, I think. We're getting rid of our callback, and then we're resolving, right? Problem solved, let's go have a beer. Only problem with that is if you are adopting a, an API that you didn't write and maybe is very large, those functions might have been used in many, many places. And when I have async add, I can't just change uh, I can't just change this to be promise based. I have to change everywhere that that was called, right? So now instead of this being async add my number, and then I get the results as the callback, I have to drop this into a then, and then I have to, let's see, then I, oh, what is it? Then I have to take the results and I have to like do that, right? And as you work with large code bases, that can be a, uh, a cause of a lot of different bugs. So what I would suggest is as we refactor this, we're gonna look at more of a real life application. 
is I have a, an API that just, it's a REST API that gives me uh, placeholder content. Uh, this is just one of the options that we're gonna be reusing, but it's not very important. This is the library that will make our HTTP requests, and then it will use callbacks to provide us with callback or a callback function for the data that we get. And so what we might what we might look like, or what our application might look like, is we're going to say, we're gonna go and get a photo, that we're gonna provide a photo ID, and then we're gonna have a callback, right? Again, we've seen this before. Uh, once we have, and then this function is going to call the request, it's going to go to our uh, API, it's gonna pass in our options, and then it's going to give us a callback function that takes an error and a response. If there's an error, we're going to call our callback function with the error. Uh, otherwise, there's no error, we're good to go. We're going to call our callback function with null because we we wanna pass a, we wanna pass a false value for uh, the first parameter. I'll explain that in a minute. And then, and then for our second parameter, we're actually going to use the data, right? And what we might want to do is, so we've got our get photo. It's going to take a photo ID. Eventually, it's going to call our callback with the response body. And then we've got get album. And it's going to take an album ID. It's going to call, call our API, same thing. It's going to have a, a it's going to give us a callback function that the first parameter is the error, the second parameter is the response. So we're going to call our callback that we have here. We don't want to have an error, and so we're going to have we're going to use the response. Get user, exact same thing, just a different API endpoint. So if we wanted to go and get a photo, and from that photo find the album ID that that photo came from, and from that album find the user ID that published that album that, pub that had that photo in it, right? Uh, what we'll have is a function that takes a photo ID. In our case, we're passing in photo with ID three. We're going to call get photo up here and we're gonna pass in our photo ID. Uh, we're gonna pass in our, our callback handler or our callback which is going to accept two parameters. One is the error, one is the photo. If we have an error, we're gonna handle the error. Otherwise, we've got the photo information. Uh, we're gonna say the photo details are this. I'll give you, I'll let you see sort of what this looks like as it runs. No, it won't. <laughs> Psych. Okay. Cool, so it's going to go and get the photo details. Uh, this is the album that it comes from. Actually, got a little bit of code down here running. Let's see what that looks like. Cool. Uh, it's going to go and get that photo request. It's going to come back with an object with the details down to here. Uh, from there, we have we have an album ID, and then we can use that album ID to go and get album. Right. So now here we have the photo. After this, after this uh, function is called, we're going to have access to the photo, which is this. And then we're going to reach into that photo, pull out the album ID, and use it to get an album. Get album is going to accept an error or the album. If we have an error, we're going to handle the error. Otherwise, uh, we have the album. And what we're going to do is console log the album details. Where are we? Here we go, the album details are, and it's that little block of code because we're console logging the album here. Uh, we're going to say, well, inside of there, we have a user ID. So we're going to say, get user with that album's user ID. We have an error, that's going to give us a user. If we have an error, handle the error. Otherwise, console log user details and that, right? That's what, the func that's what this sort of app kind of looks like. And if we wanted to refactor this, it might look something like this. Rather than going in to get photo and saying, well, photo, you know, we're going to return the new promise, yada, yada, yada. What I would recommend is just create a new function that's called uh, something like get photo promise or something to, something to define it, right? Body of the function, and we're going to say, 
Well, again, it's going to take a photo ID as the parameter. And I could very easily just copy that and paste it in here. If it's a very large function with 20 lines of code, you may not want to do that. So what you have available is just call get photo, right? We have the photo ID and we can pass that in. And then actually I'm missing one thing here is I do want to return a new promise, right? With uh, resolve, reject, and that's going to do an arrow. And then so what we can do is inside of this promise, I can call get photo and then get photo expects or gives me a callback that takes an error or a photo. And that's going to be the callback function the definition. If we have an error, uh, we can reject with that error. Why not? Uh, otherwise, actually, I don't even want that. I'm just going to return, reject the error. And if we have the error, this is going to return early. Otherwise, uh, we are going to resolve with the photo details, right? So this is a really nice pattern. If you're refactoring an API that has a lot of callbacks, is you can just write where you have the function definition from the original callback, is you can define a new function that just calls that. And then you can replace this without having to worry, or, if, or you can extend your API calling the same exact functionality uh, of get photo, but using promises instead. So now we can say, uh, do, 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 get photo, let's see. I'm just gonna comment this out, All right? Our application is gonna take the photo ID. And we're gonna say, get photo promise. And then with our photo, we're going to do the rest, which, you know, while I'm at it, I'm just going to, I'm just gonna, rather than refactoring that all live, I'm going to show you what that looks like down here. So do, 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 get photo PR, we don't need that there. Uh, console that out. Okay, so what that looks like is now we have get photo PR, which is a new function. We're not renaming the original, but we are using the original. It's going to take the photo ID. It's going to take an error. Again, if we have an error, uh, we may we probably want to return uh, reject the error so we can handle it. Uh, copy that and paste that all up in these. And we have essentially the same the same sort of function def definition for these promises uh, that are called their, their corresponding callback based API. And then so what we can do is once again, we can use not just the promises and the dot then, but we can use async await to say, go and get the photo as a promise and then we're going to console log that. We're going to console log the photo, right? And then once we have this photo, because we've awaited it, we have the photo. So we can say, well, we're going to assign the album to await the promise of get album PR using the photo album ID. And then the same for the user, right? Pretty cool. Uh, we're throwing all that in try catch so that it's nice and safe. We could drop a catch on any of these because we're in a try catch and we want to do like uh, a, a specialized error message for one of these. We can say catch the error and uh, you know console log so that I can as a developer I can see this console log the error. But what the user is actually going to see is uh, throw a new error. What's a good error? Come on. These are not the albums. Your... There you go. Got to escape it, right? You're looking for. 
Okay, cool. Uh, so then this way, if we do have an error, we can console log it so that as, as a developer, or maybe you have an API that you can send errors to so you can see how your application health is doing. Uh, but what you actually want maybe the user to see or provide some other sort of information is when this throws, it's going to get caught down here. Yeah. And then we can handle, and then we can handle the error as, as we would with any of these other not special errors. Okay. So I think that is it. Yeah. On um, 107, I don't know if you had explicitly said that syntax photo ID equals three says take whatever photo ID I send but if I don't send any default at the three, is that? Yeah, so ES6, I think, ES6 gave gave us uh, default variables or default parameters. Uh, so if I call run with 10, it's going to use 10. If I just call run without anything, it's going to give us a parameter name or it's going to give us a value of three. Otherwise, it would just be... Yeah. Okay, I think that's it. Um, I think promises are pretty sweet. I also had, uh, it was very rewarding taking an API that I didn't like working with. Uh, and it was painful because I did the approach of actually rewriting the body of the functions. And then every time I did that, I had to replace every single time that that function was used somewhere which led to a lot of bugs uh, until I finished refactoring it. Uh, but if you do it kind of this way, you can have an incremental approach. Once you go through your application and you've refactored every single call to get photo, and now there's no more times that get photos being used except here and everywhere it's being used with get photo PR, then what we can do is say, okay, well, we're not using that anymore. So let's actually take the body of that and uh, let's drop it in here, right? And this is going to, let's see, what's that going to do? It's going to call, do, 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 and instead of the callback, we're going to resolve with the response body. And I think for in this case, oh, no, we have reject the error, right? And I think that would be enough to refat or to, to finish sort of getting rid of the old API and now you have the new one. Uh, and if you want, you know, maybe this now is called Git Album PR and now it doesn't need to be because there is no other Git album. So, and this isn't even right because this is albums, so that's photos. So there you go, but you get the idea. Uh, yeah, so if we want to watch that run, let's see, we should have, that's set up. We don't have any, uh, we still have these defined because we're still using them. And we're going to run it. And hopefully, let's see, photo details, album details, user details, sweet. Actually, I should add one more thing is this async await is really awesome, but as you, if you're anything like me, as you get started using it, it's a little bit too awesome to begin with. So you want to async await everything. And what you end up with is, let's say here we're getting the photo. Let me, let me clean this up a bit, right? Doop, doop, doop. And let's say we're getting a photo and we're getting a completely unrelated user, right? So we're gonna say the photo ID is this and user ID equals whatever. Uh, then we might pass in the photo ID here and we might pass in the user ID here, but these are not related. I, I do not need photo in order to then go and get the user. Right? So the problem that we have here, the problem that we're introducing is we're saying, wait for it, you know? So is that, is that, sorry, that this is, may not be clear. Does everyone see, does everyone understand why this is a problem? Is because we're essentially waiting for an Ajax request, which could take a couple seconds to get a response for this photo 
And then once we get that response back, then we're going to get this user. But this user is, we already have the information to go and get that request. So why not send them at the same time, All right? Uh, a couple ways you could do that is, do, 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 let's see, let's say, let's get some snazzy stuff. So, so I wasn't gonna include this, but how are we doing on time? Um, I think it's, it's gonna take. It's gonna take like two seconds. We're gonna do this. We're gonna. We're gonna take. This, we're. We're gonna. We're gonna do this the snazzy way, right? The super. The super sexy ES6 way is we're gonna say const destructure uh, photo deets user deets array destructuring equals await promise dot all, and then that's gonna take a. <coughs> array we're going to drop in that and we're going to drop in that and we can get rid of those and that is a snazzy way to send two promises simultaneously with promise to all, it's going to wait for both of those promises to complete. So if this one takes a long time and this one's super quick, they're both going to go out. The super quick one's going to come back, regardless whether it was you know above or below, whether it was here. Oops, what am I doing? Oh no. Regardless the order that oh I got an error there. We go. Regardless the order that these are in, uh, it's going to send both the requests simultaneously. One's going to come back first. The other one's going to come back. Once they both have come back, uh, it's going to give us, so that would look like that then responses is an array uh, with the promise.all syntax. Because we're using async await, we actually get responses as a result. So we're saying responses equals await. And then what we're doing here to be super snazzy and probably your teammates are gonna hate you for it is we're destructuring responses is an array. It comes back in the same order that these were placed in this array, regardless what order they come back in, they're going, the responses is going to be an array with the results in the same order. And then we can use array destructuring to say whatever the first uh, thing in that array is, we're gonna give it, uh, assign it to a value, uh, assign it to a Const called photo de de and then whatever the second one was, we're going to assign it to user deets. We know that this is going to be photo. This is going to be user because that's the order that we put them in. Uh, so now that we have them both, we can do whatever we want with both of them. Neither of them are holding up the other. Pretty sweet. Pretty lame. Awesome. Super sweet. Super sweet. Um, yeah, there's a couple gotchas with that is just make sure that if you need to do like authentication or validation, you're not sending the two requests simultaneously. I've done that. And then you end up, never mind, uh, with a bug. <laughs> um, and what else? There was something else, but yeah, I don't remember. Hope that was helpful. Yeah, very good.